This is my weekly broadcast slash podcast slash offering to the world as something to do on a Sunday night to listen to and to watch. And today is a special day because I have two special guests with me today. I have my good friend Matt and Brian, uh, both in Thunder Bay, who are, I guess, people who, uh, in the case of Brian, who I stayed with and who kept me a roof over my head for years and did was there for me a lot of the time, and Matt as well, we, who was my former guitar player in Thunder Bay in 1117 in Ostrich. So, and as we have two people, I guess we might as well get right into it. So, starting with, I guess, Brian. So, we were talking a little bit before the show started about something that the Ford government in Ontario did that I heard a little bit about, but uh, I think that the audience at large might not have heard of especially outside of Ontario. So what was it that the Ford government has recently done? Uh, I'm not actually sure if they've actually imposed it. There was talk of it, and then it kind of went away, and this week it came back again. So I'm, I, I have, without any means of checking it right now, but the Ford government wants to take away sedation while people get colonoscopies. And... Uh, there was a move a little while ago that said he should, Premier Ford should be the first person to receive a colonoscopy without sedation because then he would know what it was really like. Right. But, so, hey. uh, whether they've actually imposed that or not, I can't confirm. But if they are, or even thinking about it again, I would certainly encourage them to think again. Right. And, had, and, and you uh, have had both a with and without the anesthetics. You, you've had both. So you kind of have the experience on both sides of this, knowing what it's like with the, the freezing or with, without. And so, uh, how, how, how different is it? Uh, well, generally they give you fentanyl, which is a, uh, a powerful painkiller. Mm -hmm. And for me, it puts me to sleep anyway. Like, I very seldom ever stay awake for the procedure until it's finished. But there's a small dose of fentanyl. And sometimes they used to give fentanyl and uh, Valium, for me personally, it was too much, mm -hmm. so they didn't. They stopped the volume because it, because I was going to sleep for quite a while longer than they wanted me to be be out. But we, I was suffered from colitis for many years, so I've had many colonoscopies. Mm -hmm. And years ago, they used to do it without uh, sedation. And trust me, it is a very painful experience and uh, not a fun thing to to to, to go through. During and after the the, uh, the experience, because they leave a lot of you leave a lot of air in your system, which you have to evacuate, and creates all kinds of cramps and discomfort, and just not a great thing. So, and then probably not long after, I started going to a specialist, to a gastroenterologist, when they were doing them, the the whole procedure was a completely a different thing. So it's even who is going to give you the colonoscopy it makes a difference too. Right, but uh, and that, uh, and that I, part I sounds not, like they're they're not changing that part very much. So, right. or are they? Has the Ford government kind of mucked around with the availability of doctors? Or um, oh, I, I can't speak to that. I don't, I, I don't know that. So okay, it's, uh, but I mean, they're messing with all kinds of things in healthcare, trying to cut a dollar wherever they can. Right. So, so I mean, it goes where it goes. But uh, 
that's one thing I would certainly encourage anybody who wants to, is listening to say, no, you can't be doing this. It's, it is certainly not a pleasant experience in any state, but without sedation and uh, that, that comfort ability, I would not, I could not believe they'd do that. And I've, I've experienced probably 15 colonoscopies in my life, you know, and that is, that is soon, definitely quite I'll never have to do that again because I don't have a colon anymore, but uh, that, that's, that's just the way it goes. So I, I remember a little bit of, of some of the other kind of experiences you've had with the healthcare system, and I, I don't know how, how kind of deep into that you want to go here, but has it always been pleasant? Have, have they always been doing everything, if not to the book? Did it always work, right, experience, or, or were there other no, I'm not cases sure what you're like asking that? me. If you're talking about a colonoscopy, there's nothing pleasant about a colonoscopy, Fair whether enough. you have sedation or not. Okay. I mean, like, even with sedation, you go early in the morning, you have this, whenever you have your procedure, then you have to recover, and you have to, uh, like, chances are they've taken biopsies or whatever, like, they don't do colonoscopies just because they want to have a peak. Right. Or not very often, anyway, I guess people over 50, that may happen, but uh, it's not a procedure that they just give everybody just because right. it's colonoscopy. You know, not, that's not the way it happens, so you're... Some, somehow a doctor has realized that you need a colonoscopy, and I don't understand why they think that they're going to save a whole lot of money by costing it. Oh, Matt's falling over. Uh, on that side, though, uh, when the election was announced, I noticed that Doug Ford was, he got really quiet, and it was almost as if like we heard out, out here nothing at all from him or the Ontario government. Was well, there a- uh, no, why would you? It was a federal election. Right. So, I mean, the best thing that, that uh, Andrew Scheer could have done for himself was ask Doug Ford to shut his mouth. So, and because, he, he, he kind of I did, mean, with right? The block, with the block of voters in, in Ontario, keeping Doug Ford quiet and uncontroversial as possible would certainly have served him, at least to some extent. At least that's my opinion. Yeah, but it, since the election has... Has he done anything or been out in public or anything like that that you guys have kind of heard or seen being a little bit closer to? He, he was here about a week ago. Yeah. But I think I think I was at Elton John then, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, like the last I've kind of heard from him was when he was in Saskatoon, when I almost kind of got the chance to, to meet him. <laughs> but other than that, there, there really wasn't much, so. Now, but kind of on, on Matt's side, as we were kind of talking again before the, the stream kind of started, you just got back from a, a big trip, right? Yeah. And so where did you go on this trip? I was in the western half of Hungary. Okay. And we were, we were kind of mentioning that, like, you are really impressed with tourism side and how yeah. kind of effectively they were prepared for tourists, et cetera. So maybe how exactly did that work or what impressed you about that? I guess uh, it seems like uh, a lot of people go there for like for the cheap the cheap food, cheap hotels. Like your dollar goes pretty far and the whole like they have a big lake there about 200 kilometers around and uh, this is a lot of like a lot of um, a lot of businesses like a lot of money has gone into developing that. Mm-hmm. And like you know, they have they have a zoo there, and like uh, like, a, like a lot of uh, restaurants, a boardwalk, and uh, water parks. Like 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 it has basically anything you want. So from the like, it sounds like they're on one hand it, they have it a little bit easy because their currency is so low compared yeah. to ours that they can get away with people coming. But when they get there, they have to have something for them to do, right? And yeah. Like, I know in Thunder Bay, like, they have that, that kind of tourism booklet that uh, has a, a bunch of suggestions for people who are tourists to go to. And there, it's not that there's nothing going on in Thunder Bay, for sure, for that. Thunder Bay is set up a little bit as a, a tourist trap. But is there anything specifically that might be possible to do better back home that you noticed or anything like that? Yeah, I'm just just, just, just just about everything. Oh, yeah? Uh, I don't know about that. you got to remember when you go to Europe, and whether, like, I, I've been to Germany several times. Um, last time was last year. Or, yeah, about a year ago. But they have old world charm. Everything about them is a tourist attraction. Mm-hmm. Like, as long as you're not in the center of the of the bustling metropolises, everything is old. In fact, even in the, in the, in the cities, they don't destroy their old. They build around them or they build up to them. Yeah, or, no. So it's uh, there's that, you know, okay. 
and they in in Germany. I can't speak to Hungary because I haven't been there, but in Germany, their their parks are pretty very well kept. You know what I mean? Like they're well maintained. They're well, well yeah. like they're very pristine, and uh, so uh, they don't have the wild that we do. Even right. when you go walk in the forest, that was one of my biggest comments: is you see the occasional animal, but not a lot. And you very sell in Germany. You very seldom sell uh, birds, or a lot of them at least. Where uh, you know, you go in, a, in our forest. If you can get through it, uh, you're going to run into animals. You're going to run. You're going to see birds. You're going to see stuff like that. So there's differences. Speaking of birds, uh, uh, I was reading somewhere suggesting that Canada geese are increasingly becoming uh, non-migratory. And I know Thunder Bay is one of the places that they, they kind of stop and go south, and et cetera. But uh, have you guys noticed that at all? Like, are there any well, that are staying all, all the year round? or? It, we, we definitely have that in Thunder Bay. We have birds, as long as the weather stays, where they can have some open water. Uh, on the McIntyre River is one spot, but last year it froze over and they left. Uh, but they have, because people go and feed them, so long as they can tolerate the cold, why would they leave? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but we're not by any means in a main migratory lane. Like, you know, where you, you live in Saskatchewan, on any given day around this time of year, you look up and there's literally thousands and thousands of geese in the air. Yeah, like, I, I haven't heard or seen them much. There, there was, like, one day where there was a little bit of them, but it was weird because, like, like you say, uh, normally I expect much, much more. And maybe I just like slept through it or something, but that yeah. just doesn't seem right either. So, well, you're you're in Saskatoon, and I yeah. used to live a little uh, bit further I used to south, yeah, quite a bit south of Regina. And, but just because we're in the over the oil fields and the farmer fields, you used to look up on any given day in, in the, that like, couple of week period, and you'd literally see thousands and the three different kinds of geese too, yeah. not just Canada's, but you know, there's snow geese, and I can't remember what the other one is, but there you could. There were actually flocks. You could pick out the kind of geese that were up in the air, you know. So. And uh, Matt, how how did the forests in Hungary kind of compare to the Thunder Bay ones? Like, were they closer to the Germany ones in terms of the how wild or not wild they were, or uh, how did that kind of compare? Uh, I didn't really see too much of a forest. I saw mostly like highways and uh, you know uh, fields. Okay. So, uh, but it mostly. Um, there's like a lot, a lot, a lot of lizards walking around on the, on the sidewalk, and uh, yeah, like a lot of trees, like, you know, like uh, deciduous trees with uh, like, like the, you know, kind of like big berries, either blue or purple. Were they edible berries or the not edible? Uh, no, I believe they're not edible. Okay, interesting. So, it, like, you got in Germany, um, probably most of Europe, I'm sure, trees are farmed. Hmm. You know, like so. When you walk in a forest in Germany, even if it's even not even a park forest, but generally the areas are the bottom vegetation is cleaned out. Okay. Uh, you know what I mean? Like they're thinned out, so you can walk, you can see through the forest and stuff like that. We don't do that here because right. it's mostly government land and it's mostly meant for forest companies or paper companies, and uh, so that's the way it goes. But. Um, and, and pause. So Brian, you've worked at the paper company in Thunder Bay for. Or had worked for many many years. So when when you mention things about paper, that is something you know a great deal about, right? Well, I know some. <laughs> some, okay. <laughs> but uh, so back on kind of like the tourism side, though, e even from Germany, what what does D Germany do better than than Canada in 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 that regard? Like, what about in their paper? Well, well, either paper or tourism, take your pick. Well, I mean, there. Um probably a good chunk of their economy is is directly dealt um, essential I guess to uh, tourism like all of their old castles and that they make them they, they clean them up they make them look like uh, like we call it interested uh, sites and people want to go see them and, and uh, buy souvenirs for them and all the rest of that so a good portion of their economy in the older parts deal with that like they, it's a partly tourism driven economy as far as I don't need paper, I'm I'm not even sure if Germany has any paper mills. They probably do, but most of the uh, forest where I was was timber-related forest. 
So, out of curiosity, I don't even know this. Uh, do you, either of you know if there's a bus that goes from the anywhere in the city to the old fort in Thunder Bay? Uh, yeah? I I'm sure that there's a, a, a bus. It might be the leaving bus, but I'm pretty sure that there's a bus or a shuttle that at least gets there. I know the fort has their own shuttle buses on the property. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if they shuttle to hotels or not, but... Uh, Oh, it, it, it says there's a bus number four that goes there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was pretty sure that there's actually a city bus that goes right into the forest. Yeah. Yeah, get, given I, I didn't take the bus all that much, I wouldn't know. Because it does seem that it's like a little bit out of the way, but if there's a bus to it, then at least tourists can hop that bus and kind of get there fairly easily. Uh, the old fort, of course, being a more or less complete trading fort that is still kind of set up on the outskirts of town in Thunder Bay or near the outskirts that I, I think was originally closer to the downtown area and has been moved since? Actually, uh, East End? yeah, you used to live uh, about 10 feet from the edge of the fort. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> in the historic fort, there's a, uh, a plaque not far from where, where you lived uh, that designated it was uh, the site of the original old fort. But when they wanted to build a new fort, the, the new old fort, <laughs> the historic site, uh, Obviously, there was businesses, there was residences and all that, and the cost of relocating them for the Pudo Historic Park wasn't going to happen. Hmm. So, they, so they moved the old fort up the river to where it is. But the historic park was actually right in the east end. So, so more on the, the tourist side uh, in Hungary. So what yeah. other, other kinds of things did you find about Hungary that was worth bringing up or that is different from here, for example? Like what I, what I found interesting was like if you walk past like a city worker, it's it's uh, normal to tell him he's doing a good job. Just like everyone, or just the the people who aren't from the area, or no, just like just everybody basically. Like but like if you said that in Thunder Bay, they would they would think you're making fun of them. Yeah. <laughs> so is it uh, like a, like cheering them on sort of thing, or what's that? Is it kind of like cheering them on, or yeah, it's like, it's, like, it's like showing your appreciation. Yeah. Oh, interesting. And um, uh, thank you for your service. Yeah, a, lot of the, a lot of the restaurants didn't have uh, air conditioning, though. Okay. Well, yeah, actually, I, it was that way in Germany also, depending yeah. on where it was. If it was part of a major hotel or something like that, yes, it would have air conditioning. Yeah. But there was a lot of just uh, small restaurants that didn't have that. I, I agree. I, uh, I've heard that in Germany that a lot of, especially because Germany gets pretty hot. Uh, in some parts, but there's like public pools or public water parks or something that people can go to to kind of cool down. Is that kind of an accurate thing, or? Uh, there's parks. There's definitely uh, uh, one of the interesting things I noticed uh, in past trips was we build a pool and put a fence around the pool, and then there's a park around that. What they do is they put a pool and build a park around it and put a fence around the park. Oh, interesting. So. Um, yeah, so if it's a swimming park, then the whole park isn't part of the, is part of the system. And in Germany, like you said, they would be the people would have blankets out and picnics and stuff like that, and the kids go run and swim, and parents could stay on the blanket and sun themselves or whatever. And so that was a little bit different than what we do at least here in Thunder Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, well, yeah. Matt went to Hungary. It was already looking a little bit cooler, so uh, I don't know if people be running around swimming in pools, but. If you go in the summertime, I'm sure probably the same similar kind of thing. Well, it was it was it was pretty hot when I was there, and uh, the, 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 yeah, the, the uh, in the city of uh, Papa, they had the, the water park and all the pools inside and outside are all heated. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. So the heated pools. The weather is very humid. So they had um, heated pools during the hot season. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, like yeah, like uh, pretty much every pool, like, like when it's 30 degrees outside, the whole pools are, are still heated. Huh, that is interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, you think about it, with the volume of water that, like, the Thunder Bay public pools that are outside pools, I believe they're heated it to a certain extent. But they're, I remember when I was a kid, they were cold. <laughs> they were plenty cold. You got to have a lot of nerves to swim under that stuff. But, oh, yeah. uh, and, and especially the early part of the year, they would warm up. Right. Because the weather warmed them up. But uh, there wasn't a huge amount of heating went on. But I believe there actually was a heater. But I don't believe they kept it on all the time. <laughs> But it makes sense to have them heated. If you're going to be comfortable, you know, like even even in Europe, the pools will cool off. Right. You know, 
Well, it, it was about the size of uh, like maybe one of the water parks in Wisconsin Dells, like uh, Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. pretty, pretty big, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it's just probably a, a huge business there, so they want to keep people comfortable. Oh, for sure, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So I, I was actually reading something a, a little bit earlier this week about a, a new kind of, well, not really a new kind of a solar panel, but basically a, a, a solar panel that generates electricity specifically at night. Did either of you two hear about that? Specifically at night? I know, and it I sounds know, know. impossible or ridiculous, but uh, the, it how it works is basically there's types of um, generators that generate electricity based on the difference of temperature between two materials. And at night, especially in places like Thunder Bay, you'll see pretty much consistently that the temperature drops. And it drops enough that you can basically use the fact that whatever it is the material you would normally be collecting sunlight with heats up. And so what they did is they basically use this temperature difference uh, to drive this whatever, whatever um, I can't remember the, the name of the this kind of generator, but it basically drew a, a little bit of a current out of it and then powered an LED with it. And so they had this LED that only turned on when it was dark enough that the temperature, the ambient temperature in the, the area dropped beneath the temperature of this big metal slab. And then the, the metal slab had a little bit of enough weight to it that it basically kept enough of the temperature that it gave that, that the heat back to the air slowly enough that it could basically be lit for a substantial portion of the night, if not all night, which was pretty neat. But thinking about swimming pools, swimming pools also kind of do that, right? They'll collect a little bit of temperature during the day, and they'll kind of give that back during the night. So even though it's not a lot of power that you can kind of generate from this, it's, it's just an untapped energy, which is always kind of interesting to point out. In Thunder Bay, all you have to do is look at the pool in the nighttime, watch the uh, the steam. The come steam, up, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. So, who, who, who has these? Who has these uh, solar panels? Well, I think it was just like an engineering department of some university. I'll have to look up that the link when I uh, after the show. But uh, oh. it was it was mostly just a proof of concept that yes, you can actually do useful work with this energy, and yes, an LED is not all that much useful work. But it could be enough to do something like power a small computer or power, I don't know, the, the, the cleaning apparatus for a swimming pool or something, right? Just right. a little bit of useful work that we aren't really thinking of capturing yet. Well, so. I mean, it, like solar panel technology has been advancing over the years uh, constantly. Like even uh, uh, years ago, they were coming up with a tile, a solar-powered tile, to put on northern highways that would create enough power to keep the highway lit mm -hmm. and melt the snow off them. Because they oh, heard that. Yep. You remember those? They, they came yeah. up with those quite a few years ago, and the expense, I guess, was just too great to even experiment with it or it just wasn't uh, accepted. Mm -hmm. But the whole concept was they would accept enough solar to keep themselves ice free and light the highway. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you lit enough of the highway, if you did enough of the highway with it, you could eliminate plows. And I guess the power has to go someplace, so then we use it. Yeah, I, like I seem to remember reading about some of the the trial experiments for that were not successful. However, like I wonder if there's a more modest approach that might have worked. For example, instead of trying to pull the power out and light the road and keep the road warm and not to melt the snow and stuff like that. If they only aim to just melt the snow, right, and keep the melt the snow off of the highways, and if they just aimed for that purpose alone, if they would have been able to succeed and do it. And, like, that, that alone that would have been a big win. Right? That was many, many years ago. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the technology is, has advanced, but, I mean, maybe they just left it alone after since then. I don't know. I've never heard of it since then. Yeah, but uh, another thing we were kind of talking about a little bit before the show is that you looked into getting solar panels at one point and kind of being part of the, the grid tie-in system in, in Thunder Bay. But you, you kind of mentioned that the systems that, or, or whatever it was that they had offered you didn't seem very appealing. What was the story on that, anyway? Well, I mean, what happened with me was uh, they had to apply to Thunder Bay to see if they could fit you on the grid. And the 
when they went through and did my roof, they were supposed to put 40 panels on. If you put 40 panels on, you got a certain incentive and all that. And then they, in, in the meantime, they changed the size of their panels. So I, now I couldn't fit 40 panels. I could only fit 32 panels on. Mm -hmm. It would have generated the same amount of power, but I wasn't getting 40 panels, so I wouldn't get the incentives. Oh, so you had and, to get the 40 panels then, to get the incentive. Yeah, and then when I complained about it and said, look, the power generation is going to be almost identical, all of a sudden it was, oh, well, Thunder Bay rejected your house because it's not acceptable. So I was just went, yeah, right. So, but huh. that's neither here nor there. It's uh, It was one of those ones where they would put the panels on and they would own everything for 20 years and then you would own it. Okay. And you and you only got a little piece. You wouldn't get all, all the money that was paid for. And after I looked into it, I went, you know what? If I'm going to do this, I'll buy my own. And you get the benefit right off the bat. But and what you were telling me earlier today, Saskatchewan has already canceled the program. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Ontario does it very soon themselves. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it seems to be one of those things where if one province does it, there's a good chance that the other provinces are at least thinking about it, especially the ones with conservative premiers. So there's something to think about on that. But on the flip side, on, on Matt, um, how, I guess, widespread is the, the solar panels in Hungary compared to Thunder Bay? Because Thunder Bay's actually got quite a bit of uh, buildings with them on it. But how is it in Hungary? Uh, I, I don't re remember seeing like like tons of them, but maybe about the same amount as here. Okay, so they were kind of around, but not like on everything sort of thing. Yeah, they were they weren't uh, everywhere. Like it was it was pretty like like it, I, I noticed maybe like on a, a couple buildings or on, uh, on a highway. Okay, good to know. Germany was pretty much the same. The, the, you see the occasional building with them, um, uh, but not super super widespread like. Uh, there was a couple of spots when we took the train up north where there was a couple of big solar farms. Mm -hmm. So obviously some kind of utility or something must have owned that or a town or whatever. But on buildings themselves, yeah, they were spotted around, but not, like I say, same as, like Matt said, on, in Thunder Bay, probably, yeah, you see the occasional house with them on and good for you, you know, but... And, uh, and you probably actually, uh, the, the mill has a, a good couple of them too, don't they? Like on the by the airport, kind of in that area. Well, I know the airport has a whole farm out there. Well, the airport has a farm too. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I thought the mill had like a whole bunch as well, didn't they? I'm not. I'm not aware of that. Oh, okay. Uh, it's like, but I know if you if you travel uh, over Highway 61 and look into the airport property, the uh, southern part, I guess, of the uh, of the airport, there's a huge amount of panels there. Mm -hmm. like, Probably a couple of acres of solar panels. Yeah, it's a fair bit. So, and speaking of the mill, so, like, what, do you have any memories from working at the mill uh, that were, uh, I guess, because you were kind of on the, 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 you were there for many years, so do you have any stories that you might be able to relate? Well, uh, I don't know if there's that. much. I mean, uh, when I worked, when I started working, it was Great Lakes Paper, and they were quite a leader as far as in industry goes about creating employment and, and innovation and stuff like that. And it went all the way through. And I left uh, uh, roughly around the same time that Abitibi was there with Bowwater. It was called Abitibi Bowwater. And they were going into bankruptcy. And I had enough seniority, or seniority and, and age that I just chose to leave. Hmm. So I left my earliest possible exit point. And lots of people did that. Some hung on. Uh, it's a different company now. It's called Resolute. And they're smaller than they have been, but they're still there. So right. And still, like, uh, how, when you started, how many employees did they have, give or take? Oh, thousands. Yeah. Yeah, there was uh, probably close to 2,000 employees in the mill and probably responsible for up to seven or 8,000 jobs outside of the mill, besides, you know, besides the wood people and also offshoot jobs, so it was huge. And compare and contrast uh, to today, like how, how kind of... Well, when I, when I started there, it was four paper machines. A craft mill was, uh, was running, a craft mill was being built just around the same time as I started. Uh, soon after, there was a stud mill and a wafer work plant. So it was a very widespread industrial complex. And now there's one paper machine and one craft mill. <laughs> so on the flip side of that, so... 
how has the, I guess, employment market been treating you as far as, like, you've, you've got your stable job for a little while. Which, which market? The job market in Thunder Bay. Like, how is it seeming from your vantage point? I think, like, it's, it's hard to get into, like, anything good, like the city or the government jobs, but uh, I think there's a lot of part-time jobs, uh, like, working at a fast food that are like, usually open. So, like, the, the minimum wage type things. Yeah, and, and not even that. It's like, you know, they, they give you four hours a day or something, you know? Yeah. So, like, I, I guess the, the reason why I'm kind of hinting in that direction is because the, the mill doesn't employ anywhere near as many, right? It is... Well, it's both. Yeah, both. Exactly. So, it's it's like there used to be a, a significant amount of industry jobs there, and now it's a, the, the mill is, like, operating on a significantly lower amount of people per unit of production... Uh, the, the amount of production. So, is the amount of production higher or lower? Well, it has to be lower because they have the fewer they're running. I mean, I, in the past years, they eliminated one and two paint machine and they built five, which was a much larger, much faster machine, mm -hmm. higher production. And since then, three and four have now gone on the way of the dodo. So, the only paint machine running is five. It's one of the bigger, one of the fastest machines in the world, but it's the only one running. So, right. I'm not sure about how much production it actually comes up with, what capacity it's running at, because I've gone from the mill for uh, well, nine and a half years. Yeah. And so, and the craft mill, uh, B craft mill is the only one running. So the only real, I guess, super positive, I guess, as far as environmentalists would go, is the water cleaning technology was built for running multiple paint machines and multiple craft mills, and now it runs one of each. So. It probably runs 50% capacity and is releasing probably the cleanest water it's ever had up. So, huh. because, uh, like I say, it was built to run a monster complex, and now there's two machine, two, two plants running. So, as far as the river goes and the water released, it's probably as clean as it's ever been. So, or, or possibly even kind of cleaner <laughs> than it comes in, sort of well, thing. Well, perhaps because they, they, they bring in river water mm. and they release. Basically, uh, I don't know what, how you would describe that. It, it would be neutral, pH neutral water. You know, so the water leaving is probably cleaner than the water going. Whether it's palatable or not, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I can't say that I would stick a cup of water into in the ocean <laughs> drink it. So, but uh, as far as the chemicals and the controls go, according to the law, it's got to be very clean. So we are kind of running to the the kind of end of the show here. So. Um, Starting with Matt, do you have any ideas of what, what could change, especially given your your recent trip in Thunder Bay, uh, to kind of help improve maybe the employment situation or something like that, right? Uh, yeah, that, that's a big question, employment. Maybe uh, there was some kind of like better organized, like, like, a, like a, a job fair or some kind of like, training program. I think a lot of people maybe kind of for it. Like the, uh, the, the the school or the training for some of the jobs, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe even how to make a resume. I think that people don't maybe don't know where, don't know where to go for that. Okay, good to know. And on Brian, on your side, do you have any last thoughts for uh, you got the world's attention? Well, <laughs> I have a few thoughts about Planet Thunder Bay, but I'm not going to say them on the recorded show. So, but uh, as far as the resume writing and stuff, that I believe that. Infrastructure is here in Thunder Bay, but people have to know where to access it and get to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe all that kind of stuff is is already here, but I, I'm certain that there's other things that we could do to help employment. It's whether the government and industry has desire to do it. Hmm. So, kind of a good good ending point there. So, thank you out there for listening, and thank you Matt and Brian for helping make this week possible. And for those of you on who are listening, uh, you can always uh, help this show continue by going to my subscriber star at subscriberstar.com slash Jeff dash Cliff. And other than that, I will hope to see you on my notifications of watchers and listeners in the future. And I will see you all next week.